Have you been to see a healthcare professional or been in the hospital? For sure, you've had your BMI calculated. Your BMI? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, talk, we're talking about BMI today. We're going to go there. Okay. We are Good going topic. there. The good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. All right. I'm Dr. Paul Salzo. I'm Dr. Brad Winnie. Welcome to Talking with Docs. If you've had an experience with BMI, want to share your BMI, think it's dumb, whatever, leave yeah. a comment. And remember, this is Talking with Docs, where medicine meets improv. Okay. <laughs> okay. Medprov Med is what it is. I like All it. All right. So we uh, are just going to talk about it. Leave your comments. Yes. It's just going to be an honest conversation about BMI. Yeah, but what it is, how to calculate it, where it's useful, maybe where it's not useful or maybe it's a bit deceptive, and then maybe alternates, alternate ways to assess your uh, level of obesity or your health according to your weight and your height and a bunch of other factors. Perfect. Okay, where did it come from? Where did it start? Where did it come from? Where did it go? Cotton Eye Joe? <laughs> I Let me tell you. <laughs> it's ancient. It was developed in, what was it? Like the, the early 1800s, yeah. like 1830s. Ancient. Adolf Quetelet. Adolf, not a common name these days. No. But it's hundreds of years old was the calculation. The calculation was designed 100 years ago, not really for health purposes. No, 200 years ago. 200 years yeah. ago. Yeah. For Not really for health purposes, no. just for more aesthetics, I think is what it was. Well, and he said, he was actually not even a doctor. He was actually a mathematician and a sociologist. Nothing wrong with that. No. <laughs> who wanted to measure population levels of, of weight and size yeah. and how it affected the population. So we took and applied it to an individual, which is really not what he intended. Right. No, no. He was more like, yeah, like aesthetics and, and ratios. And then it's, it kind of died for a couple hundred years. And I think in the 70s, yeah. uh, they started looking at BMI and trying related to your health right and then in the early 2000s I think insurance companies came along and said hey wait a minute we can adjust our premiums based on this because we're paying out more with higher BMI's yeah. and of course because of the dollars to the bottom line there so that became useful and I don't think it really came in clinically super clinically you applied until like maybe 10 years later 2010 ish that's when you start seeing it pop up more in family doctors offices yeah. and things like that it was more and more used clinically um, to try and predict or tie it to health outcomes. Yes. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. How do you measure it? So you don't really, really measure it, you calculate you it. Calculate okay, it. BMI is not a measurement, it's a calculation, okay. and it's, you take your, ma your mass, not your weight, your mass. Do you want me to go into the difference between weight no, and mass? No, okay. no one wants you to do no, that. I won't but do it. For all intents and purposes. Weight is the force of gravity yeah. on your body. Mass is how much matter you have. I, I couldn't yeah. resist. People, yeah, couldn't. you don't go to mass watchers. You no. go to weight watchers. Yeah, but <laughs> it's your mass you're working on. You want to change your weight, just go we're to just the moon. Gonna, we're just going to call it weight for now, and everyone's going to be happy. So you take your mass in kilograms. Yes, kilograms, okay. okay. Kilograms. Sorry. America, really. Well, no, the, America. A lot of the world is metric. Yes, but, right but I think medicine and science in America uses... And the Olympics. Metrics. Yeah, yeah. and the Olympics. Olympics. All right, so you take your mass in kilograms and you divide it by your height squared. So Your height in centimeters squared. Meters. Or sorry, meters squared. Your yes. height in meters squared. So, so this is the first hard part. If you don't know, if you're like a pounds and inches person, you've already now you got to do a complex God. calculation. But the good news is there's calculators online. You can just plug it in in any unit you want, as long as you include the units in the calculators online, will calculate yes. it for you. But if you really want to do it yourself, yep. you take your body mass in kilograms, divide it by your height squared, and that gives you a number. Right. Okay. And this number is correlated to health outcomes to a certain degree. Right. So they found a bunch of different groups. Yes. depending on what that number is, yes. and try to adjust to say, well, this window is, is this, and let's talk about the categories. Yes, so the World Health Organization came out with categories based on your BMI. Okay. So if your BMI is less than 18.5, yeah. you're undersized, you're, you're- It's very low. Malnourished, basically, it's is what low. they're trying to say. Yeah. If you're 18.5 to about 25, that's your, that they've determined is a normal BMI, yep. a normal body mass index. 25 to 29 or 25 to 30, that's considered overweight. Yes. Then you get into obesity. 
Okay. Over 30. Which is an uncomfortable term. It is. Because there's a lot of stigma. It is. It is. And I think we have to come up with it. And then so then they said, well, you don't say someone's obese. You say they're living with obesity. But anyways, it is an awkward term to say. It's an awkward thing to bring up. It is. In a clinical setting. It has but to be it's done. important. It is important, but yeah. it has to be done very carefully, of course. Yeah. Um, and then 30 to 35 is class 1. 35 to 40 is class 2. Over 40 is class 3, or what we used to call morbid obesity. Yeah. Okay? So on. So, and, and then why did the World Health Organization come up with these random lines in the sand? I don't think they were totally random, but yes. They correlated it to health outcomes, okay? Right. So they said, oh, well, if you go over 25, all of a sudden your risk of diabetes goes way up. So let's make that a cutoff. Yeah. If you go over 30, it's cardiovascular risk. So I've got a graph here that shows uh, your outcomes yeah. related to your BMI. And you can see it's a U-shaped curve. So Having too low a BMI has poor health outcomes. You get into that ideal phase, which is the bottom of the U, then all those classes that we just talked about, and you can see how the outcomes get worse as your BMI goes up. Right, and, and that's for, yeah, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, mortality. Right. It's, it's kind of not negotiable part, and that's, I mean, honestly, in our practice, if you look around and see the patients that we see that are like 80 and 90 years old, very yeah. rarely do you see someone who's 90 years old and has class, class 3 um, obesity. Yeah, right. It's uncommon. It is. And then for us in our world, yes. why does it matter for surgical patients? So talking about people who have their total knees or no, total knee replacements or total hip replacements. Right. And we actually have a little bit of video. You know, am, am I too heavy to have a joint replacement yes. or is it going to yes. make my outcome worse? Yes. Well, I, th I think it, it, the outcomes relate to your size, unfortunately. Yeah. So some of, these bad, some of these outcomes that are sensitive to BMI is one operative length, the length of time it takes to do the surgery. Yeah. With a higher BMI, it's been shown that the length of time to do surgery goes up. Right. If the length of time goes up, the chance of a complication goes up, right? Because longer procedures have a higher complication rate. Anesthetic than risk, bleeding risk, infection risk. Anesthetic risk. According to the anesthetist, it's harder to administer the anesthetic to people as their BMI goes up. Yeah. So the anesthetic risks go up. You mentioned bleeding. It's been shown in the literature that as the BMI goes up, bleeding risks go up. So there's more blood loss. Yeah. Um, the technical difficulty of the case. 100%. As the BMI goes up, the technical difficulty of the case goes up too, yep. and when technical difficulty goes up, the risk of complications happen. Yep. Fracture. The risk of fracture, a periprosthetic fracture. As BMI goes up, the risk of periprosthetic fracture goes up, and there's some evidence to say that the parts, the implants, can loosen quicker in excessively high BMIs. Right, so it can fail sooner. Right. So we kind of intimated about infection, but infection is probably one of the biggest ones that I, I'd say I worry about. Yes. So there's two types of infection. The soft tissue infection around the incision. The risk of soft tissue infection goes up as the BMI goes up. And then PJI or prosthetic joint infection, that's a deep infection in the joint. That risk goes up as BMI goes up. This is what the literature shows and this is what our experience shows as yeah. well. That's why BMI is important in a surgical setting. Yes, the one caveat I would say mm -hmm. is that um, people who carry extra or have elevated BMIs are still happy that they've had their joints replaced. Outcomes. Yeah, yeah. so their outcome is still that they're happy and they have a significant reduction in their pain, improvement of their quality yes. of life. Yeah. However, it takes longer to attain that and sometimes they don't quite attain the same objective measurable success, yeah. so but they are happy still. Satisfaction outcomes, yeah. if you don't have one of those complications, your satisfaction rate is just as high. Their satisfaction rate is independent of your BMI. Right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the limitations. Limitations. Yes. This so, is important, and this is what drives people nuts. Clinicians and patients, and everyone gets upset with this, and this is why, because it has limitations. Right, and I'd say the main thing is that it fails to assess where your weight is carried. Exactly. Right, so right imagine there. if you have a picture with three people. One of them is someone who has a very large abdomen. Two, someone else who has a very large um, waist, a very large hips, sorry, not large waist, very large hips, very large legs. Mm -hmm. And then a third person who is very muscular, say like a, a like middle right, linebacker. For example. There you go. They're a middle linebacker. Right. They could all have the exact same height and weight. Yes. So their BMI is exactly the same. Identical. But their risk of death because of a certain number of chronic diseases is very, very different. Very different. And the BMI does not capture this. Yeah. And the main reason for this is because of something called visceral fat. 
The VF. The, the VF. I don't think anybody calls it that. Now but they will. The, v, the VF is fat that accumulates around our organs. So when we have fat in our bodies, it goes throughout our entire body. But the amount that goes around our organs, particularly our liver, our pancreas, and our intestines, has a greater risk of causing negative things. And BMI doesn't capture that because you can't see that. when you. I can't still get Brad. Hey, Brad, you have fat kidneys. Yeah, you can't. Right? Thankfully. Nice chubby heart you got. Let's <laughs> say you, you can't see it. No. So the BMI calculation doesn't capture that. Right. And why does visceral fat even matter? So we actually have a very small amount of it. The average person is somewhere in the one to five kilo range or the two to 11 pounds. So it's actually a small amount of our total body weight. But this fat is metabolically active and can secrete some things that can mess you up. So inflammatory markers like tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin six, they can be secreted by this metabolically active fat. This metabolically active fat can also reduce our sensitivity to a, a hormone called leptin. This hormone is critical in making us feel full. So when you get full, your body secretes leptin that makes you less hungry. But because of this visceral fat, it can actually reduce the sensitivity to leptin, so you keep eating. And when you keep eating, you eat excess calories, and those excess calories get converted to fat. So ironically, it's kind of a self-perpetuating yeah. cycle. That's it. Yeah, but this has been directly correlated to disease, particularly cardiovascular disease, cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, insulin resistance. So visceral fat is really, really important. Your appendix is getting a little heavy. It is. It you is. can't see it. The other limitation for BMI is your ethnic background. There you go. Some people call it ethnicity. I tried, but I kept putting too many <laughs> syllables in it. Here. So I had to change it to ethnic background. Yeah, I like it. Ethnicity. Yeah. As opposed to ethnicity. Yeah. Ethnic city. There you go. Your ethnic, ethnic background, all right? That can't be captured in body mass index. It cannot. No, and we know that certain types of people with different ethnic backgrounds carry their adipose tissue differently. Yes. Southeast Asian will carry it more around a visceral fat, which is more dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. compared to a white person, compared to an African person, compared, compared to an Asian person. Yeah. So those factors are important in health outcomes too. What's interesting, there's actually been some studies that show that gluteal femoral fat, or fat that's more in your bum and in your legs, mm -hmm. actually may have a pseudo protective effect because it mops up some of the free fatty acids and stores in there, rather than letting them circulate and become part of your visceral fat and messing up like your insulin resistance. That's why like all that. the Renaissance paintings look like that. Well, it may be the Botticelli's, right? Right. Having said that. Did you say Botticelli's? Not Botticelli, oh, it's with bot an L, oh. but fair. Botticelli's. Um, and that's why we would still say that having excess weight and excess um, adipose tissue is not good for you, but where it is really, really matters. Yes. Ignored by BMI, completely okay. doesn't cover it. So BMI has a role, mm -hmm. but it's not perfect. Are there any other ways that we can measure the amount of adipose tissue that you have that are more useful, more practical, more predictive? Yes, there are other things. So really we're talking about the ratio of muscle to fat. As you alluded to, if you had someone who's really a bodybuilder, for example, yeah. they'll have a high BMI, but they may not be at risk for health, right. for bad health outcomes because their muscle fat ratio is good. So the most accurate way to measure it is with a DEXA scan, right. dual energy x-ray absorptometry, yeah. where you can send x-rays to someone at different levels of x-rays, different energies of x-rays, and they can distinguish between bone, muscle, fat, come up with a ratio and say, yeah, this is a good ratio. Problem is a DEXA scan is expensive. Yep. It's not available everywhere to have done for this purpose. Um, and, and it's not that common, really. No, it's not really practical. It's not practical, but that would be the best way to do it. So sure. there's DEXA. What so else do you there's, got? Uh, the waist tip ratio. So it's another measure that really became popularized in the late 80s and, and beyond when some studies showed that measuring your waist to your hip measurement, so the mm -hmm. skinniest part of your waist and the biggest part of your hips, was more predictive of negative health outcomes. Yeah. So for, for a man, a, a ratio of, of 0 0.9 and a woman 0 0.85, um, this can be predictive of cardiovascular uh, risk as well as mortality. Yeah, that's, an, that, that's a much easier one to do. Yeah. There's the age-old caliper test where yep. they take calipers, this is like easy peasy, Some lemon five squeezy. Skin yeah, they yeah. pinch it here, pinch it here. There's yeah. five different sites and they measure the amount that they can pinch add it all up and that can be predicted. But again, not a really practical tool in the family doctor's office. You got six minutes or whatever it is. Not accurate either. No. Uh, and then one you'll see a lot, I've seen a lot of commercials online for this stuff, is the bioelectric impedance measurements. Oh my goodness. Where you send electricity. On my phone all the time. Electrical currents. Get the body pod. Right, yeah, you can get different measures of bioelectric impedance, which is they can correlate to, it, to body fat versus muscle ratio. Those have been proven to be perfect, right Paul? No. 
No. The theory is that muscle conducts electricity differently than fat, and so they can try and do a calculation. They're, they're not super accurate, they're a bit machine dependent, and they haven't been correlated very strongly with health outcomes yet. But it might be something down the road. I think their benefit has mostly been shown for monitoring change. Yeah. Yeah, That's so if you're, if you're kind of losing or gaining, yeah. I think it can be helpful, yeah. but absolute numbers are definitely yeah. not. It's weird, it looks like you're kind of water skiing on yeah. your scale. Kind yeah, of thing. I'd buy that. Yeah. Not the machine, but I'd buy that argument. Sure. Okay, last little thing about vis visceral fat. People are like, what the heck? Now you just told me I got all this visceral fat. It's gonna increase my risk of heart disease, cancer, and death. Is there anything I can do about it? Here's the short summary. It's all the things that you do for good health. So number one, exercise. They've done good studies to show that aerobic exercise and HIIT training is superior to resistance training for losing visceral fat, but both are important. Number one is exercise. Number two, diet. Shifting to a more plant-centric or Mediterranean-style diet with less meat, less added sugar has been shown to reduce the amount of visceral fat. Don't go on a diet. Yeah. Change your diet. Change your diet. Number three is actually better sleep. People that get less than six hours of sleep versus the ideal seven to nine hours of sleep actually have more visceral fat. And the last one is stress. Stress causes us to release cortisol. Cortisol predisposes us to depositing fat around our abdomen and around our organs, probably for a primitive protective benefit, but that no longer exists. So this is really bad for us. And back in the day, if you had to fight or flight, now it's that chronic stress that never ever goes away and it really, really is dangerous. So whether it's meditation, mindfulness, something to reduce your stress is really critical. And when you're stressed, you eat. A lot of times you turn to yeah. food when you're stressed. Talking with docs is killing me because we film these at 7 a.m., which really is eating into my sleep time. Oh, come on, go to bed earlier. 7 a.m. Be like a Marine. Do more by 9 o'clock than other people do all day. All right. Nine. BMI. That's the skinny on BMI. All right. Love it. Hate it. Leave a comment. Let us know what you think yep. about it. Um, but that's basically how we use it, why we use it. It's easy to use. Yep. It certainly isn't perfect. It don't has become a lot obsessed of flaws. with your BMI either. Like, you know, don't yeah. look at that number and say, gee whiz, my, I'm 25.1. And if you're a muscle, whatever. Just yep. work on being a healthy weight, making healthy choices. Now you know. So if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel, check out our podcast. Remember, you are in charge of your own health and your own BMI to a certain degree. We'll see you next time.